Thank you for joining us for this exciting Bible study podcast as Pastor Robert walks us chapter by chapter through the book of Jeremiah. Good evening, everybody, and welcome oh, to <laughs> our Jeremiah Bible study. I see some of you on for tonight, and I see some hands waving, so glad you're there and glad you're safe as well, too. Uh, the people in the live uh, class are waving right back at you tonight, so uh, uh, glad to have you with us tonight. So we're at Jeremiah chapter 12. I hope that you were able to print uh, print your outline for tonight. We'll be using that extensively. And let's start with a word of prayer, please. Father, you are the almighty one. Uh, you dispatch from your storehouse thunder and lightning and rain and snow just where you want it and when you want it and how much you want to have fall upon us. God, we, we tremble at your power because we know it's infinitely greater than we can imagine. And your power uh, has blessed us most in the resurrection of your son, Christ, who has forgiven our sin and who has called us to himself as royalty, royal sons and daughters of the king. Thank you for granting us the gift of Jesus as we remember him this holy season again. And we turn our hearts, Father, to your word. We thank you for it in this Old Testament prophet. We ask that, God, you work mightily in our thinking and in our believing tonight, that we might understand what you've written for your people so long ago, and that we might make appropriate application to our lives yet this day. So thank you for drawing near to us this night, O oh God, as, as we humbly ask that we draw near unto you as we open your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 12, we're going to ask one of our friends here in our life study to read that chapter for us. So as long as you have it in front of you, give your attention to that. And do we have a volunteer? Righteous are you, O Lord, when I complain to you, yet I would plead my case before you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? You plant them, and they take root. They grow and produce fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their heart. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land mourn and the grass of every field wither? For the evil of those who dwell in it, the beasts and the birds are swept away. Because they said, he will not see our latter end. If you have raced with men on foot, and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? For even your brothers and the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They are in full cry after you. Do not believe them, though they speak friendly words to you. I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. My heritage has become to me like a lion in the forest. She has lifted up her voice against me. Therefore, I hate her. Is my heritage to me like a hyena's lair? Are the birds of prey against her all around? Go, assemble all the wild beasts. Bring them to devour Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation. Desolate, it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no man lays it to heart. Upon all the bare heights of the desert, destroyers have come. For the sword of the Lord devours from one end of the land to the other. No flesh has peace. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvests because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage that I have given my people Israel to inherit. Behold, I will pluck them up from the land and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I have plucked them up, 
I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them again, each to his heritage and each to his land. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people, to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it, declares the Lord. Thanks. The reading of the word for tonight, Jeremiah chapter 12. Let your eyes linger over it for just another minute or so. We'd like to fill in some good news markers, any words or phrases that uh, could lead us to some good news in a book, of course, that's uh, highly um, a judgmental upon the fallen people of God. Did you find any words in your reading that caught your attention that might point to good news? Here's our first one. Go ahead. That's powerful. I mean, th- this is really good news. Verse 15, make sure to mark that. Anyone else? Words or phrases? Go ahead. In the, in the last verb, the last verb, verb, two verses, there's hope for the nations around Israel as well. Yes. Last two verses, 16 and 17. In 14 through 17, really, we're going to see there, there is good news for Gentile nations. And this is, a, this is a rare gem in this part of the prophecy of Jeremiah, that Gentile nations also have some good news. So we'll get to that. Any other words? Go ahead. Verse 1, and we're always righteous. Oh, the righteousness of God. Brothers and sisters, there is a standard that is fixed. It's in God, and we can go to him to see that standard while our world goes wishy-washy in every direction. This is good news. There is a set standard of righteousness. It's in God. Isn't that great? Excellent. Thanks. Anyone else find a, a word of good news or a phrase? Verse three. Okay. Verse 3. Isn't that good? I I think that is too. I marked verse three. God personally knows people. Here the prophet and and by application us too. He personally, that is good news. You know, we're not just wandering by fate or by chance in this world. That has nothing to do with it. He knows us personally. So I marked that as good news also. Anyone else? He going to bring Judah to this point. He says that he tells the nations around to leave them alone, that he, he, uh, I will pluck them out of their land. And if they do bother with Jews, they'll put the Jews out of their land. Sure. Causing things some protection. So yes. He, uh, them leave them alone. God's, uh, God's love and protection, his, his uh, personal knowledge of his people, Israel. And I mean, he's engaged with that nation. And of course, that has great application for us. Yet today, when the nation is pretty beaten up, right? Another one we found? I'm looking at where God calls my people Israel. Okay. And, and you know, even though he's angry with their behavior, they're still his people. That, that possessive pronoun is a good news. Uh, can, can you help us with the verse you... Uh, in, 14. in 14. Thank you. So um, that part of it... Uh, where God calls his people, my people, you know, there's a, there's a possession there that God's not going to let the whole people go. We know of his, um, his love for those who are saved and redeemed. And of course, you know, the reprobate are going to fall away, but that little pronoun, my, I think was good news. So I like that one as well too. Tonight, there's going to be a couple special attention verses we will get at the first one typed on your outline in verse eight, the hatred of God. It's not a usual uh, doctrinal discussion that we have, but because it's pretty blatant in verse 8, we're not going to ignore it. And so we'll address that tonight. Verse 14, God's wicked neighbors. We'll look at that tonight. And also in verse 14, a key uh, verb of uprooting or plucking out occurs five times in verses 14 to 17 and is a key word that we'll look at tonight. So here's just a really quick summary of what we've read so far. Jeremiah is going to question God regarding the prosperity of wicked people, 
all those wicked people, they have such a good and easy life, and Jeremiah doesn't, right? Remember last week, he uh, was, uh, God revealed to him a conspiracy that, that his life was going to be threatened. <laughs> so here, Jeremiah is God's prophet and feels like I'm getting the raw deal. And wicked people, you know, I mean, God doesn't even bother with them, Jeremiah thinks, you know, and they live life by ease. So we're going to uh, see that tonight. And then also, as we look at a summary, God is going to warn <laughs> Jeremiah of worst days that are going to come for him in particular. And he pictures the destruction of Judah and he plans for the return of Jews and Gentiles into the land of Israel. So there's some highly prophetic sections at the close of our chapter tonight. Now we're going to do some uh, small group discussion right now. So we're going to divide up the key questions for discussion for you to take some time to work on that right now. And again, uh, for our Zoomers, uh, we need to ask you to all agree and send me a chat on which question you'd like to work on. Question one, two, or three, send me a chat. And for our tables in the live study tonight, first come, first serve. So glance at the questions, and we'll do this work at your tables for, you know, five, ten minutes. And then we'll come back together to the study. So first come, first serve. Whoever claims a question first. Skim them and we'll do number one. Okay, so these two tables will do question number one since you're small over here. All right. So question number one is taken. We've got three more tables and two questions. Which which one have you decided? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all hard. Yeah, that's a great comment. Yeah, they are. They are. And of course, number three has decided? an extensive list of verses to look up. Okay, so this table will take three and uh let's 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 see and then we've got number two left for you two tables there right okay so you've got number two now let me see what our zoomers picked okay the zoomers tonight picked number one also all right so zoomers are going to work with these two tables as well too so folks um you've got uh time right now then we're going to give you at least 10 minutes 12 minutes that'll take you to five minutes to seven to work on your question and be ready for discussion on that when we come back together, okay? So I'm going to do the best I can now, Zoom, to mute me so that you folks don't hear voices from our live class, okay? So let's see here. There we go. Okay, yeah, he's muted. I think he's muted. Yes. Okay, so how can a good God allow evil? Um, well I don't think that we can appreciate good if we don't see evil we have to see the distinct differences between good and evil or we don't, wouldn't even know that good is good that's an interesting <laughs> point um, oh I forget her name she, her, she's muted she's trying to talk but she's muted Wilma you muted no oh. Francine is muted. Francine, thank you. Yeah, Francine is muted. So am I unmuted now? There you go. I was saying, look at Isaiah 45, 7. See what that says. We can't read lips. (laughs) 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 I I thought I was unmuted. (laughs) I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. So there you go. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's to a good me, one. that kind of covers it all. But he is saying, yeah. um, uh, what is it in Psalm 73? 45 7? Yeah, 45 7. Psalm 73. Yeah, he says, trying to understand is oppressive. If we try to understand evil, um, it's, it's, it's just hard. We can't be judgmental because God's in control of everything. You know, Lynette really needs to unmute herself. You don't know Lynette. how? <laughs> Lynette, you're muted. Lynette. 
go up to the very top of the screen and find the microphone. And you're and muted. Touch, and touch it. If she's on, on a PC, it might be bottom left. Oh, maybe. It's an iPhone. She's on, she's on an iPhone. Oh. Yeah, she's muted. <laughs> That's too bad because she's a wealth of information. Yeah, all evil. Yeah. 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 Gardner is very frustrated. <laughs> I don't think God doesn't Francine. want Francine. Yeah. Francine, do you want to type that up so that Robert can see it, what you just said, and the, and the verse where you got it? Oh, the, the Isaiah one? Okay. The chap, yeah. Because then he wants to, don't just put Isaiah 45, 8. You have to uh, put it in there because, yeah. Okay. That, that one's a good one. It's a really good verse. I just sent Lynette a text. So see if she'll unmute. I think she's redoing her thing. Yeah, I think she's trying to get back in. Yeah. Okay, we're not going to answer the question. Oh, now. she said she tried to keep giving me the same message. Gail got on. Okay, good. Hmm. So. I'm not on my iPhone tonight, otherwise I could look. Yeah, I have no idea where the mute is on the iPhone. I think they're busy doing other hey, things other than discussing the question. How do you like the silence from the uh, from the people at church? I asked Robert if he thought that if maybe he muted his microphone, right. we would be so able to hear each have, other. So we don't have to listen to that noise. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. Now we just have to hope he remembers to unmute it. Good <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to see you, Ann and Greg. It's been yeah, a while. Thank you. Yep. We, we were in Hawaii. Oh, is that why he's wearing a beard? No, that's every winter he does that. Yeah. I think oh. I forgot to shave yesterday. No, the grandkids were uh, performing in the parade for the Pearl Harbor memorial, the 80th Pearl Harbor. So we went down with the whole high school, their band and their choir, and spent the wow. time in Hawaii with them. Awesome, awesome. Did, did you miss that big storm? Oh, come on, don't. Yeah. That was on the island of Hawaii. We were on Oahu. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's going to be a severe rain, though. Bruce was stationed in Oahu. Oh, yeah? We were right on yeah. Waikiki Beach, so it was really pretty. Yeah, I've, been, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there, too. I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ask, when do you most want God to act against evil? When we're repressed, uh, how would you say it? When we're rep repressed by evil? When, when it affects us personally. Yeah. 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 Whenever I turn on the news... <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> which That's lately isn't very often <laughs> that's a good point I think what, what I think of it more when I, I see the injustices done to people that are closest to me I, I, I want that to be fixed I don't like to see the people I love and, and with the most being hurt or in some kind <clears throat> of jam I see it when I went to a funeral like Saturday. Oh, yeah. yeah that was, right. That was a sad one. Yeah. Who passed away? We were gone. Um, what is Lockinger's. I don't see it. Grandson by marriage. Oh. Drug overdose. Oh. Let me ask you huh? what you said about. Uh, you are you feel it most when things are done against people that you care about. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or to yourself personally. Okay. I think our time is going to be up in a few minutes. Yeah, we don't have much time. So we got one more question there yet. Why do the wheels of divine justice seem to turn so slowly? That's time. <laughs> That's right. time. Our time and God's time is different. 
Very and he probably good. has other things. That, he, <laughs> yeah. he probably has Our other things not... going on that we aren't aware of and that those need to get finished before he can put his wheels into action. Yep, and our thoughts are not his thoughts. Yes. Mm. God is not slow as some count slowness. Isn't that a verse, too? God is not yep. slow as some count slowness. What is, mm-hmm. There's a verse, something like that. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't remember where it be. That's it, Just a just, quick note, five minutes. Day. We've got five minutes left for that. everybody, so try wow. to start okay. collecting your thoughts. You found it. Hey, you're on now. We can hear you. Go. Yeah. Well, I just thought of this scripture that said God is is not um, slow, as some count slowness, but is patient, not willing that any should perish. Yep, we right. got that. Yep. Yeah, that's, a that's good what I think. What the heck? Oh, do they chat? Write, write stuff in the chat stuff? I think, no, I don't see anything in the chat yet. I don't either. I haven't. Uh, okay, we got her retired thoughts on this. Oh, I didn't know she posted it yet. <laughs> it's a lot to type. So Isaiah 45 7. Uh huh. And then Psalm the 70, Psalm 73. Psalm 73. What was the verse? 14. Uh, that- that is uh, um, where everybody's doing, everybody's mad at everybody. <laughs> and, we're, and we're not supposed to be oppressive. We're not supposed to be judgmental. Okay. The third thing you guys said, our thoughts are not his thoughts. He may have something he has in mind to accomplish. Uh, or he stops. Okay, I'm going to put this in there so you guys can see it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yay! I am the Lord, and there is no other. Oh, you're on, Lynette. (laughs) Yeah, I, I managed to get on. I don't feel good tonight, so I'm not that chipper, but... That's okay. You don't have to be chipper. Yeah. So, any corrections, you guys? <laughs> Thank you. What does it say? I think those are very That's good. Bad. Okay. <clears throat> thanks, Madam Secretary. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Francine. <laughs> Wilma asked me about my oxygen, and, and when I sit... I take it off to sort of test it to see how it's how it's coming without the oxygen because I'm supposed to stay in the high nineties, and when I'm sitting, I'm okay. So wow. that's I good. Took it off so you didn't have to hear it humming in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Just me coughing. <laughs> mm. Well, if you need it, don't hesitate to take it. Yeah, I will. I'll put it back yep. on it. Start dropping. Sharon, so, did you want to add anything? Oh, I was just thinking about two. I think what makes me most angry when I when it's evil against God's people and the innocent, like children and um, aborted yeah. people. Oh, okay. yeah, that's a good addition, yeah. Okay, add it up fast. Uh, add, add on. Well, you don't have to add it on. I was just commenting. I think what you're right. You do a two plus? What you about? Sue, you have something to add on to this? Sue. Um, yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. It was Job. Job. Let's see. I got to find it now. Wait. About um, how can a would God allow evil? Uh, let yeah. me find it. It was Job 21. One minute and we're going to wrap up, everybody. 19. One minute. Job 21, 19. It is said God stores up punishment of the wicked for their children. Let him repay the wicked 
so that hmm. they themselves will experience it. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah that is. I don't have time to write all that. <laughs> Come on. Well, we got God 30 seconds. up punishment. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a good job. Oh, thanks. thanks, guys. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, let's unmute our. Okay. <clears throat> mute us back up. Okay, it looks like we're all set. I hope it extended time for some really hard questions out of Jeremiah chapter 12 was helpful for you to, to process and, and chew on that a little bit. And, and I'll check Zoom in, in just a bit too to see if you sent me any notes on your discussion uh, from your question number one that you picked as well too. So tonight's uh, title that I gave it, Taking God to Court, can you imagine uh, anybody doing that? I mean, th th this is risky business. <laughs> if you want to take God to task or take him to court and charge him, you know, with wrongdoing, be prepared. Um, th somebody other than Job? Yeah, th th this isn't the only one. Yes, besides Job, as you folks have heard, right? I mean, there's many folks in scripture who, who took God to court and found themselves very humbled as a pile of dust on the ground afterwards. Uh, but Jeremiah does this, and this isn't the only time he's going to do it. Uh, there, there are about five sections in this prophecy of Jeremiah where he personally ha has this very labored anxiousness of going to God and charging him with his perception and observation of things. So it's interesting that Scripture records this as Holy Scripture, because sometimes I think <laughs> we as people of God are in that same boat where we sometimes go, God, I don't get it. What are you doing? And, and wh why isn't this being worked out the way I, I think it ought to work out, you see? And we can get ourselves into trouble that way. But here Jeremiah shows us, you know, how he approached God and took him to court. So under Roman number one, Jeremiah's complaint, uh, perhaps I left for you as a bullet, the other texts that we're coming to yet were his complaints often come out as well, too, in, in chapters to come. So letter A, the prosecution, that's Jeremiah. He's prosecuting God. And of course, he, he isn't going to get real far with it. And it's a shorter chapter tonight. He starts, though, with an affirmation, which I think is the best part of taking God to court. You best start with saying something that's absolutely 100% true of God. God, you are righteous. You are the standard of what is right. You declare what is right, not me and not the world. So that affirmation in verse one is an important thing. We see in verse one, the second line, that this is a courtroom scene. Jeremiah is taking God to court. You have the word case in the NIV. You have the word complaint if you're using the ESV tonight. And you have the verb plead if you're using King James or New American. So this shows us that this is a legal setting or a legal discussion that Jeremiah is having with God. And the issue at the end of verse one right away is, why do the wicked have such an easy life? <laughs> they are blessed and they get away with murder, we say, which is kind of an unusual expression anyway, isn't it? They get away with everything and they are a treacherous people and they get away with it. Jeremiah isn't the only one who ever raised that question you heard earlier. Job did that. And I gave you other psalmists who did that. Habakkuk, in the beginning of his uh, prophecy, he raises the same question. Malachi raised it. And even in Revelation, I took you to a New Testament text if you're looking at that in your outline, that the, the souls of the martyred saints who are under the altar, we hear them speaking, saying, how long, O Lord? I mean, this, this is awful. We've been martyred. Of course, we're in God's presence, which is the blessed thing that can happen. But how long, God, until you take justice you know, on the earth, on, a, on those uh, who, who took our lives? You see, so that theme of, of going to God and processing 
God's rightness, his goodness, and the existence of evil in the world is a question that you and I will be discussing uh, until the day we're in glory. And, and then we have a full knowledge to be able to discuss the same thing there, right? Why do the wicked prosper? So we come to our first discussion question. How can a good God allow evil? When do you most want God to act against evil? And that hopefully was a practical application to you know, today's world where you see evil and it doesn't get stamped out. And why do the wheels of divine justice seem to turn so slowly at times? So don't forget, Zoom, please please send me a couple of chats so I can engage you folks with our live class too. So we have two tables tonight that picked question number one. Help us out. What was your discussion like at your tables? Um, Well, number one... uh... We, we do have choice, and, you know, evil is allowed. Um, sin, sin will occur while we're separated from God. Uh, because out of evil, he will create good for his purpose. And... You want just the answers in the first question? Yeah, question number one was your discussion. Yep. How can a good God allow evil? Um, because he is righteous and mercy, merciful and gracious. He will not just cut us off when we do evil. And his purposes will work for good throughout the evil. All things work together for good. Even that love God. Romans 8.20. Excellent. Excellent. Very helpful. Good. How about our other table that was? Go ahead. (laughs) Right. Yeah, right. (laughs) Mostly when the innocent are being okay. abused by evil children and, you know, what's going on around the world. Uh, that That's just so offensive. Right. Yeah. When those who can't fight for themselves or speak for themselves, right? A- anything else, table one or another Can comment? Yep, by all means. Oh, this verse is impressed me for a long time. It's Romans 9, uh, 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath, how does God manifest his wrath? And we see his other characteristics, but how do we know about God's wrath? It says, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction. So it's a way of God being able to show his wrath. That's one of his characteristics, his wrath on sin. And it also shows his righteousness, because it shows how opposite he is mm. to and oppose he is to, to wickedness. Mm-hmm. So I think part of the reason is for God to be able to show that part of his character is he endures with, it says he endures with much long suffering the vessels of wrath and into destruction. So in other words, he restrains himself in the meantime, giving them an opportunity to repent. Right. That's huge. Yeah, but if they don't, they're going to endure this wrath. Right. The, the patience of God in this whole process of understanding his righteousness and the existence of evil. I mean, we underestimate that hugely. I'm waiting. Um, and throughout, throughout the word from, from um, creation through revelation, we see his wrath, how he performs his wrath at times against societies and people right. and individuals to the culmination of revelation where he will pour out his okay. wrath upon all evil. Right. So his, his wrath, you know, God's wrath or, uh, you know, the evil that's in this world. I mean, he's not just the uh, white bearded you know, grandfather on a rocking chair who sits by and, and just lets everything go as it is. I mean, that that he's dealing constantly with the evil that's in our world. It it also is to provide us with an increase in faith and, and patience. Um, there's some verse about in order for the completion and the fullness of of all the um, evil and suffering that 
you know, he uses it for the glory of kind of thing too. Yes. Yeah. God who is working, you know, in all things and is gaining glory through himself, which often it probably throws us for a loop, you know, God's working and his providence in the world, even in the midst of evil that exists. I mean, he's, he's not apart from that. He, he can even accomplish his holy righteous purpose in it, which often goes well above my head in, in understanding his glory. But this chapter amongst many in Holy scripture then makes us think of, of these divine and holy themes where often people will come to wrong conclusions, right? I mean, there's evil in the world is God, and God is impotent. He can't do anything about it. That's false. Or you say God is good, but he doesn't change the evil that's going on in my particular life because he doesn't care. Well, that's false. <laughs> Even this chapter, you know, helped us to sort through some really hard things when we're looking at this issue. Now, here's a fancy word for you. This issue of studying the, the, the complexity of the goodness of God and evil existing in the world, we give the term theodicy. It may not be typed on your outline, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, theodicy, T-H-E-O. D-I-C-Y. So you can Google this and you'll find article after article after article that'll help you on a really difficult concept. Theodicy then is a, is two Greek words that are put together. The first half, theos, is the Greek word for God. And then D-I-C-Y D -I -C -Y, is the Greek word for righteousness. God in his righteousness. See, that's what we're starting with in verse 1. And how he relates and interacts with evil in the world when he himself is not evil. He doesn't produce evil. He doesn't do evil. See, the Bible, you know, Jeremiah was right. God, you're absolutely righteous in all you do. So this issue is the study in Holy Scripture of how God's righteousness providentially works in daily circumstances, in your life, in my life, in, in the life of everybody on earth. And we go, well, God be glorified because, yeah, this is, this is getting above my, my pay grade in understanding your interaction as a righteous, holy God, even in the midst of evil that is perpetrated or goes on into our world. <clears throat> so other false conclusions that God is not in control. That would be false. Even in this chapter, we are going to see his incredible control, even over Gentile nations as well as Jewish. Or secondly, that God is not good. That conclusion has been made by philosophers and skeptics of Holy Scripture from ad infinitum. See, I mean, it just God can't be good if he allows evil to exist in this particular world. Now, interesting, let your eye look at verse 2. Jeremiah makes a statement of blame in verse 2. He, uh, he, he actually blames God to some degree. How? He planted them. Yeah, God, you're the one who put wicked people on earth. You put them there, which is interesting because, see, Jeremiah understands the sovereignty of God over all people, good and evil. Well, of course, understand nobody was ever born good. Nobody ever was born good, right, from my conception I had the inheritance of sin and evil in me. I had that as a sinful human being. But Jeremiah, don't forget, he's in court. Jeremiah is the prosecutor. He's putting God on trial. And verse 2, God, you planted these people, God. It's your fault that this all happened. So we're going to see how this all plays itself out, right? And he, he's the one, Jeremiah is the one you, you see in verse 2, who uses that phrase, oh, yeah, the wicked people, they always have your name on their lips, God, but there, there is no connection. I mean, just somebody having God's name on their lips doesn't mean that they're a child of God. See, that's the origin of this statement. And, of course, that pops up in the New Testament several places. Jesus himself uses this expression, then, of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? Yeah, yeah. Their hearts are far from me. Jesus uses this. So this, don't forget, the 
Jewish Old Testament was Jesus Bible. So he took this verse in Matthew chapter 15, verse eight, and then drop down to verse three. Here's the petition that the prosecutor makes, right? Which is pretty severe, isn't it? The petition. What is Jeremiah requesting happen in court? Look at his own righteousness. Look at his heart. Examine Jeremiah's heart. Oh, we're not. Yeah, we're not. Okay. Oh, you're looking at the first heart there. Yeah. I, I'm going to get back to that point. Thank you for that. And in the next line, what does he want done with the wicked? Oh, God, kill them all. <laughs> Death penalty. Capital punishment, God. There should be no wicked people left on earth. <gasps> Oops. You know, and he'd be caught in his own argument or his own scheme. But that part, I'm going to come back to the, the top part of verse three in just a couple of minutes. Drag them off and butcher them, God. Get them. Get them. Slay all those wicked people. And then all of a sudden his conscience kicked in. And he, he knew he was a little bit in trouble there. This reminds me in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 54, James and John were in a Samaritan city that didn't welcome Jesus. Do you remember what they wanted to have done? Oh, God, let's, let's smoke up right now. Burn the whole city down because they didn't welcome you. <laughs> you know, so this impetuousness, you know, sometimes, you know, is in us as believers because we, we want the immediacy of God's justice. When we see evil, we want God to cut down those awful people right away. And, 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 and then there, there'd be nobody left. There'd be nobody left in the righteousness of God, right? In this whole thing. So uh, now here's the evidence in verse uh, four that Jeremiah presents to the court. He presents evidence. He says, Things are dying, and he connects that, of course, with the wicked people in the world that God allows. The wicked are the ones who are bringing about a dead land, right? The land is dead. The animals are dead. And somebody's got to do something about this God, right? Now, the last line of verse 4 is a little bit perplexing. Jeremiah, of course, by the Holy Spirit, is quoting uh, an expression here that the people are saying he will not see what happens to us. The question is, who is the he? And this is where Bible studying people are a little perplexed and go one of two ways. So either God will not see what happens to us because the, the wicked, of course, don't have any concept of the righteousness of God and his engagement providentially in their lives, right? God, God won't see anything that happens to us. The other option of who the he is, Jeremiah. The people are saying, Jeremiah will not see what happens to us. What, why might that be true connecting last week's lesson, the end of last week's lesson? The conspiracy to kill Jeremiah and God is futile to stop it. So the people might be thinking, right, that Jeremiah is not going to see what happens to them because he'll be dead first. He'll be dead first. So and we're left with that. And we'll have to ask God and Jeremiah someday, which one what did the pronoun really refer to, you know, in that sense? Okay. But now it's time for God. Letter B on your outline, the defense. If Jeremiah acted as a prosecutor in this courtroom, now God stands up and he speaks for the defense, which is for himself. And this is where question number two comes into play. Question number two. Our Does God actually answer the questions of Jeremiah in verse 5? Does he actually answer those questions? Why does God answer Jeremiah with questions of his own? I think that's important to ask. And what do the questions mean? And what is God saying to Jeremiah? So the opening questions, of course, from verse 1, why do the wicked prosper? They have such a good and easy life. And, and the, the treacherous people, they live at ease. Boy, they, they've got it great. They can foul everything up. They can manipulate stuff. They can get away with not paying taxes. 
you know, they can steal, rob, cheat, and they're, they, they have a happy sleep life right after that, right? So our, our next tables, right, we're addressing question number two. Does God actually answer Jeremiah's questions in verse five? What was your, your sense, folks? Who's going? Not directly, does he? Not directly. So, so what else do you make then of that or the other questions? Uh, wh- why would God answer Jeremiah with questions of his own? Make him think about it. Okay, totally, folks. Any times this happens in Holy Scripture where a question is answered with a question, you're, you're meant to sit down and start reflecting and thinking yourself. Okay, so that's super, super helpful for us there, right? Now, let's get to what do the questions mean? Did you unravel that, these two tables? What do those questions mean Because God asked two questions in verse 5. They're both parallel. Can you unwrap that? Or or what thoughts came to you when you discussed that? I came up with uh, God doesn't hesitate to do different things of what he wants. He can do good, you know, if you're being bad, you know, he he, he can make bad weather or else he can make good weather. Okay. Uh, you know, vice versa, whatever he, whatever he does. Whatever okay. Thing. So even if you don't see something happening in your world, just pay attention because God is operative and he can, of course, turn anything on a dime, right? He can change any particular plan or purpose as he wants. Yeah, be grateful for what they have, I think, you know. Okay. So a question that would lead to, you know, a gratitude for the grace of God that is operative, you know, in your particular situation or world. All right. Any other thoughts there yet? Go ahead. I think he's asking Jeremiah if he's going to compete with the wicked to be prosper and have an easy life. And he's going to be in competition for him and become like that. Okay. All right. So, so be careful of mimicking or modeling the wicked because um, you can slip into that track pretty easy too it's like if they have it better then why live good why live righteously why not just live like them all right that's helpful please it's like to me he's telling them things are going to get worse right yeah so okay you're living in your homeland and even your own families going down against you and if yeah. you can't keep up with the footman how are we going to keep up with the horses so. you know it's going to get it's going to get worse before it gets better so it's I a backhanded it's, way of saying what's coming yeah, okay. God in his mercy lets him know, you know, Jeremiah, I mean, you know, part of this is, 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 uh, it, you know, make sure your shoes are tied tight and hang on because the roller coaster is going to get a little rockier, which is an interesting way to address his issue. I mean, you're you're really you're really thinking about the ease of wicked people. I mean, come on, Jeremiah, you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> A comment or question, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in Job, uh, God asked Job, "Are you the one who created the Leviathan? Are you the one who pushes the wind to get it started? Are you the one that did this?" this and I think this is very similar. Yes. And uh, we're saying, yeah, uh, you don't have the strength, you don't have the wisdom, you don't have the love. To deal with this. Yes. Yeah, that was really helpful. You don't have the strength, wisdom, or love to deal with a world that is wicked. But, you know, but God does because in his righteousness, you know, he he can work anything at any particular time. So this is really a profound section. A comment or question on that? I think what um, Job and Jeremiah are doing in what they're when they're at, even asking the questions, they're defaming the character of God. Okay. And then that, I think by them asking it too, then it comes back to them. And then they Okay. Realize. So yeah, God, God doesn't forbid us to ask, you know, some of the hard questions about his character or his activity in the world, but there, we ought to approach it with a faith and a humility, which goes, you know, God, when it comes to this scheme of things, I know I'm in over my head, right? And here's a comment. 
when I was reading this at home, uh, I was surprised. Why didn't God say to Jeremiah what he said to Job? Who is this that darkens yes. counsel by words without knowledge? Right. Yeah, because he did. He, you know, well, of course, he gave Job 37 chapters before he came along and said, that's enough. You know, your, your processing is incorrect, you know, because there's my, my Romans 11, my ways are higher than your ways. Isaiah of uh, Isaiah 55, you know, passages like that. And there are some things folks in this world, that's just going to be tough for us to comprehend in the scheme of things. Okay. Now this is where I want to draw your attention back to a comment before on verse three, because I, I think it is interesting. You know, Jeremiah makes a statement about his innocence. Lord, you know me. I think he's trying to say, right, I'm the one who's not wicked here. You see me and you test my thoughts about you. And I want you just to see that in your text. You test my thinking about you. The question is, is my thinking about God accurate is it accurate when i take god to court and ask him about his dealings with wickedness in the world be careful because it might betray that my thinking is off kilter where i'm putting myself in the place of god or as judge and i'm testing god in some things so in this particular section we see that when we ask questions about God's providence in the world, we should be ready to face additional mysteries of God that are hidden from our wisdom often. There are, I would like God tonight, right now, to stop every abortion of an innocent child. <laughs> and I may not understand why God doesn't immediately answer that prayer right now for those, those babies that cannot speak for themselves and defend themselves. So I best, you know, rest in God's, you know, providence that he's working what I can't understand, even in the situation globally, in a situation, of course, that would concern and bother us, correct? It's not going to make me chuck my faith tonight and say, God, you don't care. You don't care. But for Jeremiah, I think it was a strength building thing. So we have two parallel questions. Please look at your text, verse 5. There are two parallel questions which God addresses to Jeremiah's first four verses. There are two arguments in these questions from the lesser to the greater. Two arguments from the lesser to the greater. The first question, the argument is, if you're getting worn out by running with men, how are you ever going to able run with horses? And the answer is... You're not. You can't. So th th this is bigger than you, Jeremiah. Right. And notice that God doesn't give a seminar on how his righteousness works with evil in the world. Notice this. God doesn't have to defend himself and he doesn't give a teaching lesson at this point. This is an opportunity for faith. <laughs> right. Jeremiah's life is being threatened, and he's going, this isn't working really well, God. I mean, I'm the one who's supposed to be defended here, and why don't you stop these people from threatening me? In fact, it's going to get worse for Jeremiah. So this argument from lesser to greater moves into the second question. So if you are moving from a safe place to a difficult terrain, you're going from safety to difficulty, or some of your translations, if you stumble in a safe place— what do you think it's going to be like when you're in a difficult place where there's lots of vegetation or terrain? The thickets of the Jordan is where lots of brush and bushes and trees would grow up. So if you're having a hard time, you know, uh, in, in plain ground and you're stumbling, stumbling there, what do you think is going to happen when you get to hard ground? Both of these are arguments from the lesser to the greater. He is indicating to Jeremiah things are going to get worse. So here's a couple of points uh, along with the ones you folks have already made that I'll add to your notes. Point number one, I think God is saying, hang on, Jeremiah, it's going to get worse. How do you like that from a righteous God? Hang on, Jeremiah. I'm not going to make your world rose petals and perfume. Jesus said, in this world, you will have 
And, and often we just don't want to believe that the righteous are going to experience troubles or trials in this world. This is a clear statement of saying, I'm there. I'm providentially in it. God is, but I'm not necessarily going to remove the stumbling things that make your life hurt because all of it builds you to be like Christ. That's a hard lesson from an Old Testament scripture, isn't it? Okay, so hang on. It's going to get worse. Point number two. This one is general, folks. There is a bigger picture, and God is constantly at work in it, though we often don't see it. There is a bigger picture. Jeremiah is questioning God on his ruling in the world as a righteous God, and evil is going on. His life is being threatened. Folks, there is a bigger picture, and God doesn't have to answer to me every time I don't understand what he's doing. Okay? It's a bigger picture. Point number three. God's questions, I agree with many of you folks, are warnings to a, I call him a misstepping prophet who wants to walk by sight and not by faith. He wants to see God's action now, and you don't pull God's slot machine handle and get what you want out of it when you want it. Right? So Jeremiah wants the wickedness of the world stopped. Now it, it doesn't work that way because I'm not in charge. Jeremiah is not in charge. There is a bigger picture. And, and God is warning this prophet with questions of his own saying, be careful. We are to walk by faith. So just because you don't see the immediate end of some wickedness in your path or in the world doesn't mean that God isn't caring, God isn't good, or God isn't righteous. Be careful of accusing God of that. I think we often do. Comment. Communicating with the missionary this week, and she was bringing up the point that we, we get caught in the weeds and we see things on a real blind level where we are. But the bigger picture is what God is doing, and he not only wants to work in other people, he wants to work in us too. He's sanctifying mm-hmm. us. So we yes. can't forget that and we don't like the process. Right. And so it makes us want to complain when actually no. it's a good thing, it's just difficult. It is good, but it's <laughs> difficult. Right. That's very helpful. Point number four I made in my own notes faith in God, trust in God, and patience with God are required. He's the potter, I'm the clay. And sometimes as he shapes my clay pot, it may hurt a little bit, right? The growing pains of sanctification. So, uh, well, now we find out God actually tells uh, Jeremiah in verse six, it's your own family, by the way. They're the ones who want to kill you. Your own family. Now, this is interesting because Jesus' own family didn't believe or trust in him either. They thought he was a lunatic. And they wanted to take him out of many situations where they thought, gosh, we don't want to embarrass the family name. Get Jesus out of there. Right. They went after him. Um, And so God warns Jeremiah, be really careful in your situation here. Don't trust the flattery of your family. It's false. (laughs) Verse six. Don't trust it. This was specific for Jeremiah in that case, friends. Be careful of how you'd apply that. All right. Well, let's go to part two, because we've got a lot to look at here. Part two is an interesting section of scripture. I call this the grief of God, the grief of God, verses seven through 13. This often is called by commentators, the pathos of God. That's a word, English word we just don't use. P-A-T-H-O-S, the pathos of God, which means kind of his exhausted grief. This is hard. We can't go far with this. But what does God actually feel when he has to cut off wicked people from his presence and blessing? See, this is what we call an anthropomorphism then because we want to attach human feelings and emotions to God And this section of scripture is one that just barely lets us or allows us to do this. The grief of God, because verses 7 to 13, 
This is where God shows Jeremiah, this is how I'm going to deal with wicked people. By the way, it's your own country people I'm going to cut off, (laughs) Jeremiah. It's your own country I'm going to cut off. That's how I'm dealing with wickedness in the world as a righteous God. So this section reveals how God feels about his fallen people, Judah. It's going to do that through seven personal pictures of Judah, where most of the seven use a possessive pronoun, my, where God in in, uh, in verse seven, in particular in the first line, he talks about my house. How does God feel when he cuts his presence and blessing away from the temple, which is his house, the place where he put his presence and his blessing? Remember, over, over the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, right, his, his presence would appear visibly. And the people, the glory of God would radiate in the temple so that they couldn't look at it. The priests couldn't look at it. God placed his name there. And I gave you text galore. He places his name and my dwelling is there. How does God feel when he has to deal with wicked people and cut them off? The wicked people in this context, verses 7 to 13, are his own chosen people it's not the people who never knew about him and never had anything to do with him you see this is how god's providence works judgment starts with the household of faith the new testament says and if that's how it works you know what chance then is there for those who are not of the household of faith you see So in this section, we're going to just really briefly in in these verses, look at these seven pictures of God's people. So the first one in verse 7, 8, you're you're going to just follow your, your text primarily now here, I hope. He says, my house, right? And what is God going to do in relation to his house? Look at the verb right before it in 7a. He's going to forsake it. How would that make God feel? He said, I'm placing my name on this house and my presence on this house forever. But now I'm leaving it. See, we're entering into territory we just can't process well. How does, how does that make God feel? He made a promise. I'll be here forever. But in this time period, in this instant, I'm leaving which means he's leaving all the people there too. You understand, you see, right? In Ezekiel, God departed from the temple. I gave you those passages, right? He said, my presence will be there to bless you, but now my presence will be removed for blessing. You will not have my blessing presence in the temple it's going to be gone later of course we see it returns god's glory returns that's the mercy and kindness of god that he'll bring that back here's the second picture it's also in verse seven it's my inheritance this is a term primarily for the land of israel but inheritance is also a term used for the people of israel it it goes both ways in verse seven What is God going to do regarding his land and his people? What's the verb? He's going to abandon it. How would that make God feel? (laughs) You see, and we can't go any further with that. Because he chose this land. He chose this people. And they who have forsaken him, he in kind will now forsake them and abandon them. Now, of my soul. That's the third picture, right in verse seven, third line. I'm going to give the beloved or the one I love, my beloved. Do you see the, the personal connection that the pronoun brings? My house, my inheritance, my beloved. Do you see the personalness of God's engagement here? You see? That's why we call this the pathos of God, because it's as if God himself is grieving the loss of his people who have sinned wickedly against him and have forsaken him. Here's the term beloved. We saw it in in, an earlier chapter. 
in Jeremiah. And God is surrendering. This term beloved is the picture of husband and wife. God is the husband and, and, and Israel is the wife in the New Testament. We're the bride. And the bride is now what? What's the verb before it? The bride is being given over to whom? Can you imagine surrendering your bride on her wedding day in her finest gown to a bunch of wicked men who would do her in in the back alley? God surrenders his beloved bride, the one he loves. How does that work in the holiness and righteousness of God, right? Scripture says God plays no favorites. He chose them to be his people, but we all understand that that didn't guarantee their salvation. They had to come in repentance and faith to God. But the nation he chose you know, unchose themselves. They rejected God and turned away from him and worshiped many other people uh, and, and many other gods, right? Picture number four, please. We've dropped to verse eight. Picture number four. He now pictures his people like a, a lion, which is doing what toward God? The lion is roaring at God, which means what? They are, the lion is, is attacking God as if God is the prey. The lion, the people of God are attacking him. How would that make God feel? Right? Who has shown love and kindness and devotion to them. Now, the picture of a lion is really unique in scripture. In Genesis 49, it's a picture of Judah. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the lion is a picture of Satan who prowls like a roaring lion. And in Revelation 5, verse 5, it's a picture of Jesus. So metaphors in scripture can be used in a wide variety of ways, and I gave you all of those. Here, Judah is that lion that is ready to pounce on God and rip him up and shred him. That's the fourth picture. And that's where we get to this hard statement in verse 8. Because you are vicious toward me, a very hard statement. God says, I hate her. This is a hard statement. And we asked several of our tables then to help us deal then with question number three. Explain how God can be a God of love. And I gave you those texts. And yet hate the fallen people of Judah. What else does God hate? And what can we learn about this part of God? We rarely, if ever, will ever look at this. I hope tonight is helpful for us to glorify God in a new way. So help us out, table uh, over here on question number three. Most of the verses deal with God hating sin and iniquity. And unrighteousness, the wrath of God is revealed heavily against all unrighteousness, and uh, the wrath is on the children of disobedience. He, he loves righteousness and hates uh, iniquity, and he hates the deeds of the neglectness and revelation. But the one passage that was kind of similar to this is where he says, Jacob, have I loved you, Esau, have I hated And that's kind of difficult, but I, I think he, he means more like his favor was on, he decided that his favor was on Jacob. And then by comparison, he hated Esau because and that's in that passage of he's the potter and mm-hmm. they are the clay, so he can do whatever he wants to with the servants. Right. And Timothy talks about you know in the master's house there's clay pots and there's also pots that are for glory. So God makes us, he creates us, he designed us for his purpose, and he's the one that decides. Very helpful. Thanks. Anything else, please? I found that uh God hates pride, and the people who are fighting against God are saying, I'm better, I'm bigger, I'm more important than God, and, and God will not tolerate that. Right. God has, a, has in, in here is a long list of things he hates, many things he doesn't like, and um, what was I going to say? <laughs> 
and it gets it gets down to the last reference here. The anger of the Lord is what results. It says the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. That's a helpful verse. So Jeremiah 23, 20. Okay. Is it also <clears throat> like you hate the sin, but you still love the person, and if they would repent, he would still take them in. He has not abandoned them yet. Yes, we're we're gonna see that in this prophecy, and we need to be mindful of that, that the that the patience and you know the mercy of God are as long, you know, as his wrath and his anger. Now, folks, one thing, just be super, super careful. Don't attach what we know of as human hatred to God. I, I, I think it's rare, you know, uh, that, that, that we righteously hate, you know, it, it's possible, right? Uh, in your anger, don't sin. It's rare that we righteously, hate. you know, it's that, that part of our emotion or, you know, our, a sinful heart that comes out towards somebody or towards something. Be careful. That's the first thing. Just because the word is the same as, you know, sometimes I've hated someone or something. Don't attach your feelings and your emotions to God because there, there is a righteousness in God's hatred. Because anything which is not righteous, God hates anything, anything that is not his righteous holy standard. Verse one, um, uh, God hates. We, we have to bear that in mind. And that's why. There is a doctrine of hell, and there is a doctrine of judgment, and it is true. Um, so, so a very stark little phrase like this where we just doctrinally don't really want to go in that direction much, but anything apart from God's righteousness uh, it elicits and brings out his anger or hatred. Please. David said that I hate the things that you hate, and I hate them with all my heart. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying what what that is. Yeah. But it also let's blind again. Right. For for us, right, to, to righteously grow in that, right? I mean, th- there's no seminar in that one. It's just the Holy Spirit that has to grab hold of my mind and heart that, you know, I, I don't love the things of the world. I mean, that I come to make sure to to hate the things of the world and stay clear of them because I want to be more like God in his righteousness. And and go ahead. In learning what God is like, we see this theod- theodicy, or however you said it. Yep. And it's, it's God's grace is very complicated. It's simple but complicated. That's helpful. God's hate. Is simple but complicated. Right. We don't yeah. understand. Yeah. These are these are great great things, and sometimes the simplicity of a statement of God could take us days and weeks, you know, to ponder how how this all works out. So humble faith, people. Right. A humble faith. We need to finish a couple more pictures. Uh, please look at verse nine. Look at verse 9. This is interesting. I think I heard our original translation said something about a hyena. Yeah. Hyena. That's really interesting. I'm not sure how it got there. Let's work at least the NIV and the other ones I found. A speckled bird of prey. He, he, he goes from his people being pictured as a lion in verse 8 to this bird of prey, a carrion bird, and it's speckled. The speckled part makes it different from all the other carrion birds. And so thus the other carrion birds come and attack it because it's different. So God's people, Israel, are different. And because they are different, other birds come to attack it is the unfolding of this word picture And that explains an awful lot of the animosity and hatred toward Israel in these latter days. That the other birds of prey are attacking it because it's speckled. It's different. And how does God feel that, you know, the world's anger and hatred is going to be leveled against Israel? And, of course, all you've got to do is read Revelation. You understand in the tribulation, this is all going to pour out upon his people and God is going to vindicate his people. In the last days, 
Uh, then we're in verse 10. We finish uh, the last two pictures. My vineyard in verse 10. And the vineyard is ruined. It's ruined, right, by God's own people. And then the second and third lines, he talks about my field um, there and my pleasant field. He adds the adjective to that. So here we round out the word pictures that God uses. And this whole section, though, is a section that he's outlining, you know, his judgment. He's going to depart from them and they must leave his presence. So finishing Roman numeral two in our outline here, here's the judgment of God that's leveled against his wicked people first. In verse 10, they, it will be a desolate land, right? In verse 11, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody in, in Israel cares about what's going on. That's the sin problem, right? The pride and the arrogance of people. And there will be, in verse 12, destroyers who will come against his people. They are unidentified at this point, but historically it was the nation of Babylon. But interesting, even as destroyers will be sent against his people, whose sword is it which sends them? It's the Lord. You cannot separate providentially the Babylonians attacking Israel and God attacking his reprobate people. You cannot separate those two things. Thus, in our own lives, friends, even in the trouble, God is not absent in the trouble. He is working in it and through it in your personal life to accomplish a righteous purpose. Open my eyes, God, that I might see those wonderful things you're doing always in my world, right? Well, now verse 13 closes with the Genesis curse. You plant wheat and the Genesis curse, you're going to get thorns. This takes us all the way back to this is what God said would happen when his people, I mean, this is the conclusion of God's mercy has run its course. His love and faithfulness have run its course. And now all you're going to get is is thorns and you're going to be worn out from self-effort in verse 13. And the only thing you've got left is shame. That's all you've got left. That's the clothing and garment you wear. Well, we're going to close now with part three, which is a prophetic plan that God has, which is just glorious and rich. We're going to do this section together. Look at verse 14, verse 14 to 17, our prophecy, which is rich for us. Look at verse 14. Who's God's target audience now in verse 14? God is now shifted in the discussion of chapter 12 from how his righteousness deals with the unrighteousness of his own people. Now in 14 to 17, he will deal with the unrighteousness of those who are not his people. This section deals with the Gentile nations, the Gentile nations. And you and I, by prophecy, appear in this section. Notice the personal pronoun, my. What do you make of that in verse 14? My wicked neighbors. Folks, he identifies with his The providence of God. In those who do not call on his name so that he identifies in his grace, his love, his mercy, even with those who don't call on his name. They are wicked. This is a term for the Gentiles in this section. Now, who are Israel's neighbors today? Let's do quick geography. Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, those are the three primary neighbors, all Gentile nations. God is going to address them in this text tonight, okay? Uh, you, 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 yeah, Gaza Strip, you know, whether you say that's uh, uh, Palestinians or uh, Arabs, Arabia, or even Egypt, you know, with that section, those are the primary neighbors that Israel has today. 
Israel's surrounding neighbors uh, moved into Israel after two strategic times. So this is the fastest review we can do. In 586 BC, when the land of Israel was deported into captivity, do you think they just left the land sit there, the neighbors? Free land. It was free land and free occupation. So the surrounding neighbors moved in. You, you have to understand this background. The same thing happened, secondly, in 70 AD. When the Romans destroyed Israel in 70 AD and Jerusalem in 70 AD, the primary occupants of the lands were Arabs. Arabs. The Arab world moved in and have been there ever since. Follow the text. Follow the text. Does this verse 14, does this verse speak about occupying people in Israel today? As for my wicked neighbors who seize the inheritance I gave my people Israel, I will uproot them from their lands. Does this speak about occupying people in Israel today? Oh, man. The world is shaking because God is addressing even yet the battle for land and occupation. The city of Jerusalem is still divided. The nation of Israel has been parted out even since the the 60s, folks. So we are going to look at four brief prophecies in our time that remain in this section. They are indicated in your text by the statements, I will Or, I am going to. Do you find them in verse 14, 15, 16, and 17? The last four verses. Every verse has a promise that God will do something. These are future prophecies we believe yet to be entirely fulfilled. God's action in verse 14 is the primary verb. Um, I am going to do what? The first uh, prophecy in verse 14, what's the primary verb? What is God going to do? I will what? Them. Pluck or uproot. God is going to pluck or uproot. That verb is found five times in the next four verses. Pluck or uproot. Now, what does this verb, to pluck or uproot, say about God's providence in the Gentile world? Folks, he can move any nation at any time, whenever he wants. We have to believe this. Here's a prophecy of what what he's going to do with Gentile nations in the last days. What does it mean to uproot or pluck up? What does that mean? Give me a synonym. Completely. You're taking the roots. You're destroying them completely. Okay. Get, get, relocate. He's going to relocate people. Transplant. He's going to transplant people. He's going to move people out of one location to another. Is, is, is that the power of a, a, of a providential God? Comment or question? Oh, is he moving them out of Jerusalem? Or we're getting there. You're asking the right questions. Well, Comment even, or question? Even when, before they had that war, um, a lot of the, the Arab people, they wanted to stay in Israel, but they didn't want to move out. And they would like to come back in. Mm-hmm. Israel was saying no, because they don't want to be overwhelmed by all the numbers right. and all the kids they have. They would, but they, they voluntarily, voluntarily left all their stuff, because they thought they would win and they would come back and take it all over again. Yeah. But that didn't happen. But I also heard a lot of them are moving out of there because they want to go to other countries. Sure. Like come to the United States. So God is moving them out. Yeah. In various ways. This verb, you understand, means to displace people, to move them, or to exile them. Uproot, pluck out. Okay? Now, why will God disrupt Gentile nations in verse 14. Why? The answer is in the opening part. This is what the Lord says. As for all my wicked neighbors who what? Who seize 
or touch my inheritance. This is talking about the land and the people. Take your pick. If you touch it, the, the Hebrew verb is really specific. I mean, you just touch my land, folks. You better look out. You have the God of the universe against you because God chose the land and he chose the people. You don't mess with the realtor in this situation. No trespassing. You cannot occupy God's land and get away with it if you don't belong there. This is overwhelming prophecy. God will disrupt, uproot, pluck out Gentile nations because they seized land and they touched it. They moved into it. They occupied it. They used it. Okay. Now the question still begs, who's moving where, right? So now we're to prophecy number one. We're in verse 14. Prophecy number one. I will uproot them from their lands. I will uproot them from their lands. Who's moving where? This is, again, the context of wicked neighbors. This is Gentile nations. Where is God moving them? I will uproot them from their lands. Well, if they've seized the inheritance then some people are being moved out of Israel if they've seized the inheritance or the neighboring people catch this. This is the best I can do on this one. If he's just looking at Lebanon and Syria and Jordan, right? Who also have um, occupied parts of what Israel used to be. If God is going to uproot Gentile neighbors from those lands, It may be because he's redrawing the boundary of Israel the way it was promised to Abraham. And the boundaries of Israel promised to Abraham in your notes in Genesis chapter 15 was the Euphrates River on the north, which means you've got to bump Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan back. And see, all those things, and, and the river of Egypt in the south. Now, Israel has nowhere near that real estate today, folks. So if this prophecy speaks of God bringing the original boundaries back to Israel, he's uprooting Gentile nations, either who are occupying Israel or because they are occupying land that belonged originally to Abraham. Does that make sense? Okay, so this will take a lot of processing for us, right? Let's go to prophecy number two. Arab nations today. Yeah, those are Gentiles. Arabs are considered okay. Oh yeah, they're not Jewish. There's only there's only Jews and Gentiles in the world. So God's gonna push back. Right? And you know what? I think he's righteous. He can do it. See? Prophecy number two is in verse 14. So number one, I will uproot these Gentile neighbors from their lands, and I will uproot the house of Judah from among them. What is this prophecy saying? Bring back, bring the Jewish people back to their land. Okay, so uprooting, it's applied both to Gentiles and Jews. You see, God has no favorites. <laughs> he applies uprooting to, to all peoples, Gentiles and Jews. So here, bringing Jewish people back to their own land. Now, um, this prophecy, of course, is critically important because the rest of Scripture bears out that, you know, God is going to bring his people back, even from all over the globe and in the final days, right? So let's go to number three, because I I just looked at my clock there as well, too. We're going to verse 15 to find prophecy number three. So after I uproot them, and the them in verse 15 certainly would, would, would go back to both the Gentiles and the Jewish nations, because both of them are uprooted in 14. So after I uproot them, here's prophecy number three. I will again have compassion And I will bring each of them back to his own inheritance and his own country. What's God doing in this prophecy? Okay, folks, it's, there's a lot of moving in the, in the first two prophecies and it's, and by God's compassion and mercy, follow this. They're going to be moved back. Now, what sense would this make except this amazing compassion and grace of God that is still working in his Jewish people and in his and in the Gentile nations, Arab nations and such who don't claim his name, his compassion, which is going to accomplish something. We believe this will occur in the messianic kingdom. And I only gave you three passages 
to illustrate that there will be Gentile nations who come to saving faith in Jesus Christ in the last days. Isaiah 19.25 says Egypt will become God's people. Assyria will become his people. Assyria is modern day what today? Uh, You don't have to go that far north. Syria. Syria will become God's people. In Jeremiah 48, verse 47, in your notes, Moab will come to Christ in the last days. What nation is Moab today? Jordan. Do you you see? God's working in the last days. So Gentiles, he displaces, and then he brings back Gentile nations who will be converted to Christ. And in Jeremiah 49, verse 6, it's the Ammonites. They also were in the territory of Jordan. So, folks, the Old Testament said God was bringing Gentiles, peoples, to saving faith in him. He's he's providentially working everywhere, in everyone, at every time. And finally, as we close with a prophecy number four in verses 16 and 17, which is really powerful. There are two conditional statements in 16 and 17, and, and now... Uh, We're considering, of course, the Gentile nations again. If they learn well the ways of my people, see, the the, the Gentile nations who are being moved back in, they are being invited to learn what the Jews know about God. If they learn well the ways of my people, and if they swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, even as they once taught my people to swear by Baal, then they will be established among My people. Here's the salvation of Gentile nations in verse 16. It's posed as a conditional statement. Future salvation of Gentile nations. The condition is is one of allegiance. The condition is one of allegiance, right? Will you follow God's ways, the ways he taught his people Israel, will you learn my ways? The Abrahamic covenant, right, said uh, every nation who blesses Israel will be blessed. Every nation who curses Israel will be cursed. This is this is Abrahamic covenant language. And if you swear by my name, what would it mean in the Old Testament to swear by God's name versus to swear by Baal's name? Yeah, this is a this is a confession of faith. This is then, in essence, a conversion. If you will come in faith to the God of Israel, then, here's the prophecy, they'll be established among my people. The Gentiles will be in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ when he's in his messianic kingdom. Okay. Well, if you don't come in saving faith to Christ, verse 17, and if you don't care to follow God in his ways, then... Folks, this is the righteousness of God, verse 17. Here's the second conditional statement. If any nation, you see Gentile, this is a Gentile, that doesn't listen, this is Jeremiah's word for, not just in one ear. This is the word for obedience in Hebrew. The word listen always means obedience in Hebrew. You can't have one without the other. It's just inherent. If you will not obey Jesus Christ as the messianic king, here's the prophecy. I'm going to completely uproot and destroy you, which is the righteousness of God come full circle in the chapter. Okay. Now, do you know why Jesus in Psalm 2 verse 9 will rule with a, oh, you knew that. This prophecy ties together that part of it, that there will be no disobedience in the, in the messianic, the millennial kingdom. When Christ rules in Jerusalem, there'll be no disobedience to any nation, uh, Zechariah, who does not come and follow the ways of God, the, the, the feast of uh, tabernacles and such they're, they're removed from the kingdom. They're rooted out. Um, Isaiah and Micah and other prophecies in your notes, nations will stream up to Jerusalem saying, come, let us go worship the Lord. (laughs) All of these tie together in this particular spot. In Zechariah chapter 8, 
there will be 10 Gentile men from all languages and nations, which will take firm hold of one Jewish person by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. That's what's being prophesied in these closing verses in miniature. The conversion of Gentile nations, which is illustrated all throughout the Old Testament. Friends, as we close, because we're just a little of OT, I'm going to remind you of a couple of scriptures from the New Testament, then which, which draws us in. Ephesians 2.19, you brothers and sisters, we're Gentiles in this picture. You are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people. That's what you are in Christ. This prophecy saw you and your coming to saving faith in Jesus. It saw me. We are fellow citizens with God's people. Colossians 1. Once you and I were alienated from God We were enemies in our minds because of evil behavior. That was us. Verse 22 in Colossians 1. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish. And free from accusation. This is how God's righteousness works. It has declared you righteous in Jesus Christ. So, you know, we all live about 70 years or so, you know, 70, whatever. We see a tiny piece of what God's doing. Yeah. We don't understand, but look at this huge picture. Huge. Jeremiah you know, can only see what he can see. Yep. Yeah. God is showing Jeremiah, I have a great plan to go to the yeah. You're only seeing a tiny piece. I'm doing right. a great work. Yeah. So I hope that's a blessing as you process and ponder those prophecies, which, yes, Jeremiah could only see so much. Even we, you know, from our vantage point of New Testament believers, you know, we, we, we tie together as much as we can. But, oh, the gloriousness of God's righteousness. Let's have a closing word of prayer and we'll be dismissed tonight. Father, thank you. Thank you for declaring your righteousness amongst us in the holy pages of scripture. Thank you for being righteous amongst us. Thank you for sending Christ who is our righteousness, our hope and our glory. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given your righteousness as a free gift for all who ask for every wicked sinner who asks to be found righteous in you and to glory in you. God, We celebrate you uh, and the gift of Jesus this, this holy season of Christmas again. We celebrate you, Jesus, because only you could, could have the patience uh, and the mercy on my heart and on my life to bring me to yourself, even in these latter days. And, oh, God, you are doing a marvelous word. Forgive us for our short-sightedness when we don't see what you're doing in the midst of an evil, reprobate world. And God, help us to have faith that trusts you are working marvelously and wonderfully in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones who have yet to come to you, in the lives, Lord, of the most wicked people on this planet. You are accomplishing your holy purpose. And God, we pray, work wonderfully and marvelously through the gospel in these holy days, God, and bring many many lost people, hardened sinners to saving trust in Jesus Christ. We celebrate you, Jesus. We lift you high because it's entirely about you. And we thank you for the precious gift of yourself in the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.